Thank you very much, Rebecca, uh, and thank you uh, very much to uh, JVP for putting on this event today and having uh, me participate here. Uh, I just want to say that it is very important to have uh, JVP's voice represented uh, in these corridors, and I hope this is the first of more briefings of this type to, to come here. Um, my name is Yusuf Munair, I'm the Executive Director of the Jerusalem Fund, the Palestine Center, which is in Foggy Bottom, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with us. Um, and I just wanted to begin by kind of providing a framework uh, for this discussion. Um, by talking about how we got um, to the situation that we are in today, and um, how the calculations of the main players involved um, really need to change for us to see any kind of um, change on the ground or movement towards a more positive um, outcome. Um, today, in 2014, we are more than 20 years since, of course, the Madrid Conference uh, and the uh, Oslo Accords, which were signed with great fanfare and celebration uh, down the road from here in the Rose Garden. Uh, and there was, uh, at that time, about um, uh, half, if not um, a third of the number of Israeli settlers in occupied Palestinian territory than there are today. So despite the fact that the major players involved embarked on a path towards the stated outcome of a two-state solution with a Palestinian state in the West Bank uh, and, and Gaza uh, side by side with Israel and peace and security as, as is the verbiage. Um, what we've had in the time since then is actually a movement away from that goal. Uh, and towards the further entrenchment of Israeli occupation through the expansion uh, of uh, Israeli settlements through the building of a uh, apartheid wall and an overall entrenchment of the type of um, policies of, of inequality um, uh, which we are seeing uh, put uh, into significant action in the past few weeks. Um, so what has happened? Why, despite this um, supposed agreement uh, and good faith between the parties, are we so far removed 20 years down the line from uh, where uh, we said we wanted to be two decades ago? Um, I uh, argue um, that the main reason that um, we are at the spot that we are in today is because we've sort of believed in a myth uh, for all of these years. Uh, and we owe it to ourselves and all the people involved to be honest with ourselves about this myth, bust it, uh, and understand how the reality should shape um, our policies that we should advocate moving forward. Uh, that myth is the myth of unsustainability, and we've heard it for many, many years from many different people. The notion that the occupation is unsustainable. And perhaps for some people in this room um, who have heard and even repeated this myth, um, this is something uncomfortable to hear. But the reality is, uh, more than uh, Mubarak and Gaddafi and many others, the Israeli occupation of Palestine has been more sustainable in the Middle East than anything else for the past five decades. Uh, and we need to look at the reasons for that uh, to understand how that is going to change. Um, many people will tell you uh, that Israel has an interest in ending the occupation because it is caught in this identity crisis wherein um, it wants to be a Jewish state and a democratic state and yet it rules over the lives of half the population which have either second class citizenship or no right to vote for the government which rules them. And so this identity crisis is supposed to motivate Israel to end its occupation. I would argue that the only time you see uh, anyone's behavior radically change because of an identity crisis is perhaps when you're dealing with teenagers. But states do not change their behavior based on an identity crisis. They calculate their behavior and how they are going to act vis-a-vis -vis the people within their borders and the people outside of their borders based on what they perceive to be their interests. And the Israelis today simply do not see an interest in ending the occupation. The peace process that we've had for the past 20 years has only supported decision makers who have come to this conclusion by making the costs of occupation lower and the rewards, both political and economic, for continuing the occupation higher. So what do I mean by that? 
First, in terms of the cost of occupation, the political process and diplomatic process that was, you know, the negotiations that have gone from uh, the Oslo period uh, to the roadmap period to whatever it is this period that we just concluded, uh, have acted as diplomatic cover for Israel to continue what it's doing without facing any uh, international opprobrium or repercussions uh, from other players within the community, within the international community. Um, and during this same time, the defense consumption um, uh, per capita uh, compared to Israeli GDP per capita um, over the past 20 years has halved. So what that means is that the relative costs, actual military costs, of maintaining an occupation have become far more tolerable to an, an Israeli state that is not ostracized by an international community, but rather has a thriving economy at its disposal and a population which, when not confronted with the reality of the occupation, really is not challenged in any way to end it, or not motivated in any way uh, to end it. Uh, at the same time, political dynamics in Israel have made the continuation of occupation more rewarding. Today, more than ever before, uh, we are seeing the um, settler constituencies and right-wing constituencies within Israel playing a greater and more influential role in decision-making in Israeli governments than we have in the past. Uh, it is unfathomable today, uh, given current dynamics and trends, to see an Israeli government come out as the product of an Israeli election today wherein settlers and um, parties which give great deference to settler interests are not in key positions to dominate um, policy making and decision making within the Israeli government. Um, and, and I think that if you look at the election numbers, um, and, and many have, and you look at sort of the trends, this is only uh, continuing to grow. In large part because, uh, first, you have a um, dynamic within Israeli politics where Arab political parties are more or less excluded from the dynamic. And you still have to get to 61 members to form a government. Well, the largest parties now and those that continue to have the, the most support are the right-wing parties and settler constituencies play a big role in supporting those parties, but have also now become key players with their own parties, like that of Naftali Bennett and Bayit Bay Yehudi and, uh, and so on. Uh, make no mistake, uh, these constituencies are growing both in number and in fervor, and the election numbers over the past two elections have proven that uh, as well. Um, so what you have here is this reality where despite the conversation uh, between the major players about a stated outcome where we want to see an independent Palestinian state, all the interests are structured for Israel to prevent that outcome from coming to fruition. Um, that has to change for there to be a different outcome on the ground. Uh, as I said, states don't change their behavior because some possibly far off identity crisis that they may have to uh, deal with one day. The reality is today nobody is making them face that reality. They are able today to continue with occupation continue receiving the defense of the United States at the Security Council, continue to receive um, billions of dollars in aid uh, every year. Uh, and as long as that continues, uh, it's hard to see decision makers in Israel really come to different um, conclusions. The uh, most recent talks that uh, fell apart, fell apart in large part uh, because of this inability to press Israel when it mattered the most. And on the you know, simplest sort of things. Uh, we saw in um, last June or July it was when they began this nine month period of, of negotiations. Um, the Secretary of State, John Kerry, uh, announced the beginning of this uh, process uh, with the lofty goal of coming to a final status agreement at the end of a nine month period between the most right wing uh, government in Israeli history and the Palestinians. Uh, and they would embark on this path based on an agreement to exchange, to release Palestinian prisoners um, in exchange for uh, the Palestinians holding off on any further bids to internationalize uh, their struggle through institutions like the United Nations. Um, what we saw is that when it came to the release of these prisoners, 
the Secretary of State uh, of the United States was unable to leverage uh, the weight of the United States, of his office, of the office of his boss, to get the Israelis to keep uh, the agreement that he brokered, that he guaranteed for the Palestinians when it came to releasing 26 prisoners. That's when this fell apart. 26 prisoners. And so why is, why is this example important? It's important because it's a microcosm of the larger problem. If the United States, which is ostensibly the mediator in this uh, conflict, cannot get their own client state for which they are giving billions of dollars a year and to which that state owes its continued existence through their overwhelming defense and military support from the United States, they cannot get them to release 26 prisoners. How on earth is this broker going to get their client state to divide Jerusalem as the two-state solution calls for, to come to an equitable agreement on the question of refugees, to withdraw and dismantle the majority of settlements in the West Bank. It's not possible. And so um, what we need to start thinking about today is first being honest with ourselves about what the reality is on the ground. The occupation hasn't ended because it is not in Israel's interest to do so. Now, how do you change that? Well, I think there are uh, people that work in this building and buildings down the road that can do a lot to change that reality. Um, we can do that uh, first and foremost uh, by uh, stop making, by stopping to make the occupation so rewarding. Uh, we can do that by ending the persistent aid that is given to Israel on an annual basis to the tune of billions of dollars. When just this morning, if I understand the news correctly, Israel was welcomed into a Paris conference of, of um, economically powerful states, uh, which is a, a new benchmark in the um, uh, success of the Israeli economy. Um, so instead of giving them billions of dollars a year, we can send a very strong message to a state that clearly does not need this uh, support, uh, but, it can, but it can at least bring our, um, put our money where our mouth is, bring our actions in line with the stated policy which we uh, desire to see um, uh, brought into reality. Um, but I am not holding my breath for people that work in this building. Uh, or in others uh, uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, in positions of power, to change those policies overnight. Um, I, I do believe that the biggest shift that we are witnessing today um, is a shift from the uh, role that states and governments are playing in handling the Israeli-Palestinian issue uh, to civil society, uh, which is taking up um, the... Uh, taking up the responsibility that states have more or less abdicated. Uh, and I want to be clear, this is not the preferred path. This is not the best way to do things. We're talking about BDS and other civil society actions to create pressure on Israel. It is the last resort because states simply do not want to do what they can do to change this situation a lot quicker. I would much rather that we see the kind of tools in our diplomatic toolbox that we use with Iran and other states when we want to coerce their behavior, used with the Israelis when we want to change theirs. It's very easy. We can stop giving them aid. We can start implementing sanctions. We can stop defending them at every turn at the United Nations, but we don't. And so what is left for people who still care about this issue, who still care about the human rights of Israelis and Palestinians alike, are other non-traditional methods which, which they, through which they can leverage uh, the means that they have to create any pressure through either economic movements like boycott, divestment, and sanctions and broader education and awareness campaigns which could eventually translate into the future, hopefully, to state action at a later time. Um, this is not a rosy picture, but this is the picture that we face today. Uh, and I think first and foremost, as I said, if we are honest to ourselves, it becomes far clearer to see the path forward. And um, for each of us individually, I think, uh, we can uh, reflect on what it is that we could do on, on an individual level and also on an institutional level 
uh, like folks in the Presbyterian Church did most recently by acting as a group to pass divestment measures to send a strong message to the Israeli state that even if governments are willing to turn a blind eye, people with responsibility at individual levels and collective levels around the world in those states are not going to be willing to do the same. And so I think that um, uh, despite um, the lack of optimism in this, uh, the fact that it offers clarity and a path uh, forward is something that um, all people interested in a just resolution to this issue um, can cling on to and, um, and work with um, to move uh, forward from this point on. Thanks.